Uh, science really is a journey. And, um, uh, you know, I think a lot of us um, are influenced by mentors and influenced by environment. And uh, we follow the data, you know, uh, where it takes us. And I think that is something that's wonderful about our field. Uh, we never stop being trainees. We never stop being students. We never stop learning and changing uh, to try to attack uh, and solve the most interesting problems that uh, we, we run into in, on our journeys. <clears throat> we, we, still, we still continue to work very seriously on chromatin remodeling complexes. Uh, we actually uh, published in the collaborative work in uh, science uh, uh, a month ago or two, two months ago on the structure of, of risk, a switch niff like complex and its uh, ejection um, and, and sliding mechanism. Um, we also work, as Miles mentioned, on chromatin and development, uh, especially in the early zebrafish and uh, in early uh, mouse and human embryos as well, to understand how you sculpt chromatin uh, before uh, zygotic genome activation to uh, properly activate or repress developmental and housekeeping genes. But um, today I'm going to focus solely on one story. Um, uh, it's split into three papers, um, our, our work uh, to understand germline stem cells. And um, the way I got into this work is uh, uh, we, I was fascinated, as, as Miles mentioned, about uh, relationships between chromatin and development and how you might use chromatin to poise genes uh, for uh, subsequent activation and development. And I was thinking, what would be the most interesting place you could look for poising of genes? And I thought the germline, if you could actually uh, test whether there was evidence for um, packaging and poisoning genes in a particular way back in sperm and eggs that would then have an influence on um, subsequent development that that would be an interesting area to look at. So we actually conducted the first examination of chromatin structure and nucleosomes in sperm. Uh, and this was published um, yeah, maybe 10, 11 years ago. And uh, that, uh, the basic result was that uh, you do package genes both for development and for housekeeping genes particular ways uh, all the way back in sperm. In fact, the developmental genes are packaged very much the same way they're packaged in ES cells. So um, that was the, our initial, I'd say, uh, uh, interest and uh, observation that's really motivated a lot of the work. And since then, I've been very interested in germline, germline stem cells and developmental potential. So today, I'm going to tell you about our, our progress in that area. Um, we've been working in uh, applying genomics uh, to this area uh, for, for quite some time. And um, this is a, a, a group of people uh, who, who know a lot about development, so I won't spend too long on this. But um, uh, this is not, this cartoon is not to scale, but it's meant to demonstrate, I think, this, this fascinating stem cell system in the germline. Um, we're interested in the test, in the testis as a whole, uh, uh, the niche and the germline stem cells. Um, uh, the seminiferous tubule um, is, is shown here. And basically, it's a developmental pathway where you have the undifferentiated or uh, quiescent or slowly self-renewing uh, stem cells uh, here at this uh, basal uh, membrane. And then development goes from lamina to lumen. And uh, this is blown up here. Uh, basically, uh, and this is exaggerated a little bit for size, but it illustrates the point, that you essentially have a laminar component that houses the stem cells themselves, the self-renewing, and then they start differentiating. And once they commit to meiosis, um, they pass through this junction and then uh, undergo meiosis, become spermatocytes and spermatids, elongating uh, spermatids, and then finally mature sperm. The, um, they're supported by a variety of cells, uh, Sertoli cells, which are inside the tubule, and then these uh, uh, myo, tubular myoid cells uh, form uh, the, the outer lamina. And then on the outside, there are also Leydig cells, which make hormones like testosterone. And so we're, we're very interested in many, many of the aspects of this. What determines, how do you build this structure? Uh, what determines the um, self-renewal uh, versus differentiation of these stem cells? Uh, uh, how do you maintain this compartment for a lifetime? So how do you balance self-renewal and differentiation for a lifetime, right? Uh, and also, how does the niche uh, influence this process and make sure that it, it, it works, again, uh, well for, an, uh, for a lifetime? And I, I don't have time, but I want to make sure I give 
proper credit to the decades of work that has been done in mice. For time, I can't compare. This is such a, a, a complex process that I can't, in every result, tell you what's been known in a mouse and the rat, et cetera. That comparative stuff is very interesting. Um, but there has been beautiful work done in rodents, including mice, on physiology, genetics, molecular work, um, a, a genetics especially, which you can do in the mouse, a ge a genomics and single cell analysis in the, in, in the mouse. Uh, in humans, however, when we started this in about 2016, there wasn't any genomics or single cell work that had been done. It was already known that there was notable differences between the human and the mouse system. A lot of similarities for sure, and we could use those similarities to kind of pin the human work to see where we are so that we had conference, confidence then in the differences that we were observing as well. Uh, for example, there's a major difference in the percentage of undifferentiated spermatogonial stem cells. Uh, so it's maybe 0.1%. Uh, or less in a mouse, and it's several percent in human cells. They don't undergo the same level of expansion in humans. Uh, they don't have a long syncytia uh, the, in humans like they do in mice. You know, they can be 16 aligned, 16 cells at, at some point in, in um, uh, the uh, spermatogonial differentiation. And also, there's puberty in humans. We go through this long time. I'll be talking a lot more about this of you know 10, 11 years. Uh, where uh, the stem cells are undifferentiated and, and, and basically quiescent and then transition, as I'll be telling you more about, doesn't happen in the mouse. The mice essentially have a, what's called a first wave, um, uh, where uh, there's tons of stem cells at that time, and they either have two, one of two fates. They either take up shop in the niche, and they become long-term, or they can contribute to the long-term stem cell population, or they go on to differentiate into sperm at that time. So that's that synchronized first wave, which has been fantastic for studying the process of of comedogenesis by uh, uh, many people in the mouse, but that just doesn't happen in human cells. So I think, or in the human system. So I think there are similarities and lots of differences, and of course, uh, we, want, we want to understand those, those differences uh, in detail and study the human, and we thought with the uh, type of single cell and other types of genomics approaches that we have in our lab, we had an opportunity with the, um, uh, the sample pipeline, which I'll tell you about, to really make some uh, inroads on into the human system, we and others. Uh, so uh, the uh, physiological, I'm going to tell you three parts today. I'm going to tell you about um, our initial attempts to understand spermatogonial stem cell development um, uh, using the initial fluidine uh, system, which involves cell sorting. Uh, then we, we progressed to the 10X system where we could look at the whole testis and do the adult atlas. And then the third uh, part, uh, which was published this morning at 9, <laughs> um, uh, the atlas of puberty. So it's a... It's an opportune time for me to be here. Um, so uh, we, we, have, we have a set of short-term goals, many of which I'll, I'll go through here today in the work. But we also have some long-term goals, because I want to give you some of the perspective, what the opportunities are. So we, uh, most of what I'm going to tell you about and we're doing is, is this. I'm understanding the stem cells and the niche and, and, the, and the problems I was telling you about self-renewal, development, potential, et cetera. Uh, and and we're, I'll tell you about our progress there. But we, what we'd really like to be able to uh, use that work to take the field forward as well in, in um, defining human spermatogonial stem cell cultures. Uh, this has not been done with human. Uh, it's been done with the mouse very effectively. Uh, and this is another major difference between humans and mice. It's actually not that hard to grow spermatogonial stem cells from the mouse. Um, and, uh, but nobody's been able to do it from human. And if you're on your computer, you can check it. And you'll say, Brad, there are four papers that say it's done, been done. Well, it's never been done twice. <laughs> OK? <laughs> so that's the problem. It's fair, fair, fair statement? Yeah. OK. So, um, and they almost immediately lose their, um, uh, their, their germline identity. They essentially become. Um, um, so they first become yes-like cells, and then they differentiate very quickly. So that is a huge goal for the field. Uh, we also want to understand germ cell tumors, how they form, and how fertility might be treated. Um, so a better understanding of these stem cells, which are the origin of these, uh, of these germ cell tumors, I think is, is critically, uh, uh, we need to know that, especially the drivers are known. Because you can sequence, you can find what uh, some of the mutations are, and they often upregulate uh, KRAS or this transcription factor, DMRT1, which you'll see more of. Uh, so an understanding of these stem cells, I think, is, is important for many, many reasons. From a fertility perspective, infertility in men is actually reasonably common. And if you had an in vitro system, you might have, in the future, uh, be able to transiently express a wild type gene for which they're defective, which you would know by sequencing. And you could uh, then enable the in vitro production of sperm to restore fertility. So I think we have. Um, a medical uh, fertility reasons to understand this system in, in great detail. We have cancer reasons, and we have massive, I think, basic science reasons to study the system. So we'd like to contribute to this field. 
So the work began leveraging what other people had told us before about human spermatogonial stem cells. And that is, the, uh, the, there, were basic, there were basically two flavors. I'm not going to get into the A dark, A pale. I can ask questions, answer questions about that later. But in terms of being able to separate cells out, um, it was known from the work of others. Uh, there was a lot of physiology and immunistic chemistry that the quiescent stem cells, um, the, uh, the earlier cells, uh, uh, many of them would have SSCA4 as a, as a cell surface glycolytic mark, glycolipid. And uh, the more differentiating cells uh, had, uh, were KIP positive. Okay? So uh, this is true in humans, not true in mice. Uh, this is uh, shared between humans and mice. So uh, the first uh, paper on this, uh, we did max sorting and enrichment for SSCA4 and KIT. And we would stain them. And yes, there were many double positive cells. And that was fine, because you're going to have cells going through a transition from this state to this state, and they'll be double positive. And then you can do their transcriptomes and see if there are discrete stages that these stem cells are going through to help understand how they make this journey. Okay. So we did bulk RNA sequencing. I'm not going to tell you anything about that, because I think all the, the major uh, information came from the single cell and totally backed up the bulk sequencing, but really deconvoluted it in an interesting way. We did attack sequencing, which is a way of looking at open chromatin in a genome using a transposase, which hops in where there are no nucleosomes, so you can mark where the open chromatin is in cells. This is a powerful technique because it, it gives you strong hints about what transcription factors might be active at that time, because you can dovetail the open chromatin with binding sites for transcription factors. We also did DNA methylation uh, profiling to see whether DNA methylation was changed during this process. This, these were the early days. I'll, I'll tell you in the step three has 10,000 cells in it. Step one had 93 cells that, that passed our, all of our QC measures. This is the fluidine system. The sequencing is very deep, but you don't get as many cells. But still, I think as I, uh, we were able to go a long way, I think in, in um, providing classes, states of stem cells, which were then validated in the later experiments I'll tell you about. Then we did analysis uh, of the, that single cell data using TSME clustering, monocle pseudotime, and a set of validation experiments, which I won't show you. Um, since this work was published a couple of years ago, and um, I want to tell you two more stories that relate to it, I'm just going to tell you the take home message, but I need to tell you because it's the foundation for the next two stories. Okay? So um, and this was, uh, the take home is that we were able to identify four separate states that these cells go through. Um, they are, there are cells which you can see have, um, are transitioning between those states, but we, we think these states really, really are reasonably discrete based on all of the, um, of the data that I'm not showing you. So uh, the first state we, we call the undifferentiated um, uh, the stem cell state. Uh, it has some markers that are high in it, uh, which are familiar from the mouse, like this marker ID4. I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna try not to get into too many markers. I'm gonna try to keep it at concepts, but uh, I have to show some markers to, to provide uh, sort of signposts for people who are fam familiar with the area. So it was known from work in the mouse, for example, that the undifferentiated uh, stem cells were ID4 positive. There were, several, like, there were FGFR3 positive. So these are markers known in the mouse. So we were confident that a lot of the data aligned. Um, they, uh, there are other factors which had not been characterized in the mouse before that we were able to show were fairly unique to the uh, human system as well. Uh, I think what we, uh, when you move from state one to state two, uh, something very striking happens. Uh, you move from a state of, of quiescence to one of proliferation. So what turns on is Ki67, lots of cell cycle genes, lots of genes involved in DNA replication and repair. So this, as I'll show you now, and I'll tell, you'll see very clearly in the data slides I'll show you later, is a major transition from quiescence to proliferation. Uh, the other thing that happens at this time is many of these factors turn down, so your stem factors really, some of them really fall very strongly. The next thing we noticed, which is very clear in the data, what, uh, was an effect on metabolism, okay? And we noticed that in the, these undifferentiated cells had very high levels of this guy called TICSNP. This is the master regulator or negative regulator of glucose uptake. So these cells actually, if you look at the transcriptomes and infer the proteome from them, uh, they are glycolytic, but they have very little glucose, okay? 
because they have high levels of this protein. If the, it then drops like a stone when you go from one to two and proliferation happens. But what also happens now is that metabolism kicks in. Um, so NADPH dehydrogenase uh, factors uh, turn up. Uh, ATP synthase uh, factors turn up. So you are now utilizing um, glucose to, to make ATP, for example. So these guys are becoming quite metabolically active. You also see differentiation transcription factors, some of which were known in the mouse uh, to turn on at that time. Um, uh, so we can see differentiation phasing in. We see changes in splicing. Um, and uh, and these, these metabolic and differentiation uh, factors phase in as the stem cell factors fall. Right at the end, uh, when you transition from state three to state four, uh, basically the, um, r the proliferation takes a nosedive. Uh, KI67 turns off as these guys prepare to enter meiosis. So taken together, we think we have a logic, a basic logic for how stem cells transition from a fairly quiescent and metabolically inactive state to one that's proliferative, metabolically active, and then finally make a commitment to differentiation by going post-mitotic. We were also able to identify that, yes, indeed, these stem cells have the signaling pathways known in the mouse to be important for growth in vitro. So they have the receptor for GDNF and GFR-alpha-1, FGF-2 uh, uh, receptors, uh, FGF receptors 1, 2, and 3, LIF, for example. So those are all present. This is sufficient for growing mouse stem cells. It's not for humans, but they have the receptors. But they also have a lot else going on in the Wnt pathway, PDGF, uh, BMP receptors, T-SPAN receptors, which I'll be talking more about, integrin, et cetera. So we think that it's a more complex, probably ligand uh, relationship uh, and maybe attachment relationship that you need in the, in the human stem cells than has been needed in the mouse system. And we're interested in using this information about ligands, receptor interactions to help us do, the, do, to do culturing. We have not been successful yet, but we are working hard on it and we have made progress and I can take some questions on it later. So um, after that first paper, um, I think the, the, the strengths were the, the staging and some of the insights and in mouse-human differences and some potential ligands for culturing. But um, it was not complete in that we did it by max sorting and you sort of only get to sort out what you know, right? <laughs> so if there are cells that aren't SSCA4 positive or aren't KIT positive, you don't see them. So what are you missing, right? So you want to be able to get other states. Uh, we knew nothing about the development of the niche cells, um, the presence or properties or development of those niche cells. And we don't know anything about the interesting conversation that might be happening between the niche and the germline. So um, 10X genomics and their approaches was really helpful for that. Uh, when it could be coupled with a, um, a, a system uh, of, of testis isolation that we could exploit in many, many, many different ways. So the first samples we had were basically from patients with idiopathic pain who wanted a, a, a testicle removed, okay? So that doesn't happen very often, um, uh, but, uh, so, uh, but we were able to get through the first work to do that. Uh, during that work, we decided to set up a collaboration with Intermountain Donor Services, now called Donor Connect, um, who are basically the rapid autopsy group that provides hearts and livers, lungs uh, to donor recipients all across the Intermountain West. They were not harvesting the testis at that time. Um, we've set up a collaboration with them where we can get samples. We, the samples are available from people all the way from infants to very old men. Um, and we get them basically within a couple hours of, of death. Um, and then we process them immediately. And we are very reg regimented about how we do the, collect the collections and the processing so that we can uh, minimize technical variation in all the work we're doing. So we are now, uh, this is enabled by Jim Hotaling, a, a surgeon at Utah who's a close collaborator of mine. Uh, we're getting one to three pairs a month, again, of a wide age range. The first study was just men at peak reproductive age, so uh, late teens and 20s, um, but we're doing a lot more with this um, collection, which I'll tell you more about in a moment. So uh, actually, I don't, I have the statistics slide on here, and I guess it went away. So uh, what, what, we, what do we do? We do three biological replicates, okay? We also do two technical replicates for each of the samples, so we have six samples total. Um, the slide I took out would have shown you that the R values are extremely good, both for the technical replicates and comparisons of the biological replicates. Uh, we really can't tell much of a difference at all between any of these three biological or technical. So we derive six very large data sets, which could be combined as a reference data set that we hope will be used by us and others as the reference data set going forward for all the other studies we're going to do in 
puberty, fetus, infancy, adult, aging, infertility, et cetera. So um, I'm going to show you, um, some of you may be familiar with this, some of you may not. Um, this is a common way of showing single cell data called a TSNE projection. This is a program uh, called, uh, for, uh, called T-Distributed Stochastic Neighbor Embedding, which is a nonlinear dimensionality reduction algorithm for exploring high dimensional data. So basically, um, the, each of these dots is a single cell, and you take the entire transcriptome, right, all the features of it, from that multi-dimensional data, and you basically crush it down to two dimensions, uh, and you let each of these cells, if, if these cells are like another cell, they're placed close um, on this dimensionality reduction program, and if they're very different, then they're far away, okay? It's nonlinear, though, okay? So it's just meant for a projection. You have to use other types of analyses like clustering and et cetera to analyze really how far apart things are, but it's a great way just to show the data and discuss it and know what to think about what to do next. So uh, just from this projection, though, well, as soon as I saw it, I, I was very excited about the data because what, we, what you can do is we could show is that basically these clusters represent the different somatic cell types, and this swoosh from here through here is basically all of germline development okay, in a swoosh starting with the spermatogonial stem cells and ending with mature sperm, okay? So how do you establish that? The computer has no, has no idea about biology. It just knows numbers, and it's just putting cells as, as crunch numbers, either together or far apart. Well, you can do something called casting. We know about the biology. We know the, what the difference between a light egg cell and a spermatogonia from lots of work in the mouse. So what you can do is you can take what you've learned in the mouse and you can say, okay, what lights up in my clusters? So casting means what you do is you take all the cells and you turn them gray and then you let them be red according to how much gene expression is in that cell for that gene you're interested in, okay? And you now start casting everything you know about the mouse onto it, okay? So for example, VIM is a gene that's vent and a gene that's basically in the somatic cells but not in the germline. So immediately you know the, 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 um, the somatic cells from the germline swoosh. And you don't just do one, right? I'm showing you a gallery of 20 here. We do like 300 <laughs> just to make sure we know that we're assigning things correctly. But you, I won't go through all these, but you can take you know, some markers, which are the marquee markers in the mouse from myoid cells and it only lights this cluster, Leydig cells, DLK1 only lights these guys. So you can, and then you can basically go around um, uh, 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 gametogenesis from markers known in the mouse to be in, in spermatogonous stem cells and just kind of walk your way around, um, uh, around germline development, okay? And uh, what you find is a lot of what you thought was true in the mouse is true in the human and then some things are different. But the extent to which things are the same gives you confidence about the differences. You can also use a program called a monocle, and there are various versions of it, but I really like it. There are others out there too, um, uh, which is called a pseudotime. What does pseudotime mean? Pseudotime means that the, the, um, the program is trying to find sets of cells that are on a continuum. They're not that different from each other, but you can see the changes moving in kind of a linear fashion. It will also find branch points. It's really um, effective at finding cells, progenitor cells, and that then branch into two different types. So this is an arrow that's essentially pseudo-drawn by the program that says, I see a developmental trajectory uh, through these guys. Um, they, they are actually similar to each other in following a course. The other way you can look at this is you can take all the guys and crunch them down basically to the line, the pseudo-time line which I've done here, I've maintained their color. So you can see them going from here, purple one, down to mature sperm here. And you keep them on the line, but then you say, okay, let's look at the inventory of gene changes, right? This is not a subtle number of genes or subtle changes, right? An aggregate, these are thousands and thousands of genes. And each one of these stages is actually characterized by very large numbers of genes changing as you go from one step to the other, okay? Through spermatogonial changes, through the gametogenesis process. So um, it provides then uh, an inventory of over 8,000 genes and an order that can be used as a data set to compare anything you want to now in um, elderly, puberty, infertility, et cetera. You actually have this going now in biopsy samples too, um, we and others.
So the next thing you can do is that TSNE is great for looking at everybody, uh, but you can also start saying, okay, this is a blob here, but is this, is this set of spermatogonia here, um, are there more subtle differences that you could see if you didn't have to compare them to um, you know, myoid cells? And so what you can do is you can take the cells out and recluster them. So we take out uh, this guy and this guy, which are this early and later spermatogonia, as I'll show you, and you can recluster them and look at them in isolation. So if you ask TSNE to recluster, uh, this is what you get. You get basically one, two, three, four, five along a continuum, and then pseudo time puts an arrow through them like this. And then the first thing we asked was, okay, we've got these cells from this procedure. Well, this procedure is right, no sorting, right? You look at all the cells. There's a completely different library prep, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So very different than the first paper. Uh, but if we compare the markers that we got in the first paper for states one, two, three, and four, how do they compare with what we now have when we did lots and lots of cells? So it turns out that the, we, there were definitely four states, and they put them in the right order, and all these cells are state one, two, three, and four. Okay, so that aligns with the first paper. But we had a whole group here which did not look like this, these guys. Okay, the computer put them at the start of the pseudo time, but that's again the computer doesn't know development. But if you crunch them down then to pseudo timeline and you look at the genes, again, we're looking at a large number of genes that are changing along this timeline. What you find is the guys that it calls state zero have hundreds of genes, right, that are up in state zero, down in state one, conversely higher in state, um, sorry, down in state zero, but higher in state one. Okay, so it's not just three genes, it's hundreds of genes that are different between those two states. There's probably some heterogeneity between them, that's fine. But um, they, they are quite different from one another. And uh, so we were interested in whether these guys might be um, a, a distinct state. So here is the node I told you a lot about before. That is the node between state one and state two. It is a virtual flip of the transcriptome at that time, okay? What was on turns off and what, uh, many things that were off turn on and you get basically cell cycle and mitosis and then you go through the stages of, of upregulation of the mitochondria, et cetera, and then finally commitment to, to uh, meiosis and gametogenesis. Uh, so everything in the first paper validated by the new work and a new insight on a state zero type. So um, the, uh, we now have, we thought we had five states, and if you, you can compare them to the mouse work, et cetera. And again, I'm not, I don't want to get too much into markers here, but there are a few things that caught our eye. For example, I hadn't shown K60, K67 yet, but look, it's basically off in state zero and one, and state two, bang, goes up. And then in state four, it turns off because you're going to go and post mitotic to become meiotic. Um, this is a common marker used, in fact, a classic marker, one of probably two or three that's used in the mouse. Uh, to say I am an undifferentiated spermatogonia. These are actually a very high GFR alpha one. It's the uh, receptor for gene ENF in state one, but it's really very few state zero cells have a GFR alpha one. So it's one of the distinguishing features uh, between zero and one and a difference between mice and humans, which we don't think, uh, or, or we don't have evidence that they have a equivalent state zero cell. So um, what is unique about state zero? Uh, they have, um, PWL4, which is a marker we're using a lot. Uh, they also have PWL2, um, so they have a, I think a small RNA repertoire that we think might be very, very interesting uh, for suppressing retrotransposons and other targets, and we're very interested in uh, uh, looking at this work more closely. They also have specific transcription factors like EGR4, chromatin factors like MSL3, and cell surface markers that we can and have used to sorts, even in the paper, uh, T-SPAN 33 here, which is um, high in state zero cells. So we think this is a state that um, is distinct and can be studied ba based on the fact that we can now um, uh, fax them out. And uh, I'm not going to show the data for time, but we did sequential fish with Long Kai at Caltech to validate several of these key uh, markers and immunohistochemistry and other staining methods with Anne Gariley, uh, and a very uh, good collaborator at Oxford. Uh, I think for time I won't go into the uh, single molecule uh, validation. Um, it, it's published and it's in the paper, but it, it's a really uh, nice technique, the single molecule fish. And um, Long Kai is now, I think, ramping this up to, um, to, to multiplex at thousands of, um, at lo of loci. They've had a couple nice papers on this recently. So um, I, I said before that the computer says state zero comes before state one, and meaning it's the most, possibly the most undifferentiated stem cell in the adult. And we hypothesize if that's true, how could we test it? And it's, uh, you know, we can't 
They're not like mice, you gotta do it with humans. What we thought would be a good test of the model is if you actually looked at what uh, infants have. So uh, infants don't make sperm, they only have uh, undifferentiated spermatogonia. So what do their spermatogonia look like? Do they look like state two? Do they look like state one? Do they look like state zero? So um, we, um, from our donor connect collection, we had two infants, both of which were between 12 and 13 months. Uh, and uh, they have very few germ cells, but all of those germ cells, when you uh, infant germ cells, when you combine them with the adult germ cells, um, overlapped very well in the state zero range. So um, we, they were all positive for the markers that I showed you in the previous uh, slide. So we think this provides evidence. And Miles' lab has evidence from this from neonates as well, that there is an early stem cell uh, we call state zero uh, that is uh, present uh, at birth and with you for your whole life, um, and from which all these other states are, are likely derived. And you need a balancing system to make sure that you can keep them at the right uh, uh, state and rate for your life. So uh, we did, um, one, one of the things that, uh, uh, one of the other ways we analyzed the, the, the data was using a, a program from the Karshenko lab called Velocity or Velocito. And um, actually this came out in 2018, but we saw the beta version of this in the BioArchive early and applied it early, because I thought this was a very interesting uh, program. Because what it can do is it can take your single cell data and say, okay, let's look at the introns and say, where is this, by just looking at the introns, what's, what is this cell trying to become? Is it trying to go somewhere? Um, so is the intron repertoire um, similar to the next state or not? And that's a, that's a basic way of looking. So it's basically inferring nascent transcription by looking, doing intron analysis and comparing it to the, to the uh, uh, total RNA pool, the splice pool. So uh, what I thought was of interest was two things, is that there's a population, a subpopulation of state zero cells that seem to be wanting to move into the state one direction and a population of state two cells that seem to be wanting to move back into the state one direction, okay? And it made us think a lot about the potential of plasticity, that may, maybe one of the ways that you wanna balance these stem cell populations is that actually they can go back and forth, okay? And remember, it's not just a few genes that are changing, it's hundreds to thousands of genes that are changing in these state changes. So how, how normally when you go through development, you open and close chromatin, you uh, DNA demethylate, you, you methylate, et cetera, you, you make yourself go forward so you can't go backwards. So how much is the, um, is the chromatin changing? So what we did is we did um, a taxi profiling of these early state cells with SSC4 and these late state uh, cells with KIT. And we asked the extent to which their, um, their ataxic maps are similar. And we also compared them to ES cells, uh, for example, to, as a comparator. And what we found was that the SSCA4 purified and the KIT purifieds are actually very, very much like one another. Um, there are a few dozen changes uh, in the genome, and we're interested in knowing whether those are potential drivers uh, in helping state move forward and back. But uh, we've done a lot of attack seek profiling of development in other contexts. And usually, when you see you know, 500 genes change, you see 500 loci, I mean, 200 or 1,000, um, uh, either promoters or enhancers open up as part of that process. Okay, to see thousands of genes change and, and to see 23 <laughs> attack seek changes is a, a real disconnect in, in, in my view. The second thing is there's almost no change in DNA methylation. There is nothing above a false discovery rate of 1% that changes in DNA methylation between this state and this state. So what, I am, what I'm speculating and will propose is that this is uh, a, the chromatin basis for plasticity. That if you want to move forwards and backwards and you want to be able to do it fairly easily, you don't commit yourself to large changes in your open chromatin and you don't DNA, DNA methylate your way through the developmental process. It allows you to go backwards without putting in the kind of um, uh, enzymatic and organizational power like you might have to with TET proteins, which Anjana was a big discoverer of, um, to do that type of process. So, um, uh, so if the chromatin is open right from the beginning, where is it open? and does it make sense, okay? So what I'm showing you here is the difference between a spermatogonial stem cell and an embryonic stem cell and in the chromatin map. And what we decided to do is to look at our maps and say, okay, what is open? Open means you get the transposase to hop in in a stem cell, but not open in the, um, in the uh, 
uh, embryonic stem cell. And this is the unfiltered list here of what's open. So unfiltered, so these are the top 12 guys. And it's basically CTCF DMRT1, which is famous both in sex reversal and in cancer uh, uh, tumors. And then you see pioneer factors, and you see um, uh, uh, hormone receptors. So we're, we're interpreting this as it's an open landscape upon which pioneers work together with hormone receptors um, and other factors to maybe guide you, help guide you through this developmental transition process, okay? So what this um, uh, work which was published last year, I think told us was we have five states. Those um, uh, we, the I think, Bigger contribution here is this identification of the state zero cell, which we think is right there in, at birth. I won't tell you the data, but we've been able to trace this back now into the fetus um, to identify the time at which this cell is actually identified. Um, we think it goes through this uh, regimented steps that I told you about before. Um, and we think it might be the reserve stem cell that you always have. And I've told you about our speculation about a chromatin basis for plasticity. I will say that there is complementary work, which I don't have time to go into all the comparisons, um, from several other labs, the Tang Shao lab, uh, the Herman McCary um, uh, work, and also nice work from, from Miles that was published that I think complements uh, the work. And I think between the labs, uh, there's been major progress in using these genomics technologies to understand all of these questions that uh, I've been discussing. So the last thing I'm gonna do is talk about our it was unpublished until this morning, uh, Atlas of Male Puberty. And uh, we were able to, these are incredibly difficult samples to obtain. Uh, we were able to obtain a, a spectrum of samples through um, puberty. Uh, it's a small number, but um, this is, ba basically these samples are almost impossible to get. Um, so uh, we felt fortunate to get them, and I thank the families and uh, who were, um, able to, uh, to donate these um, for, for these efforts. And uh, we uh, uh, did the same replicate structure, two um, uh, technical replicates uh, for each uh, sample, and then we could compare them to our um, infant data and our adult data to understand the process of puberty. So I'll just say, <laughs> puberty, uh, the, the male testis and the female breast are the two organs that change dramatically after birth. Right? So that, that if you look at the, the testis in, in humans, and out of a seven-year-old, for example, it's basically these little cords. There's no seminiferous tubule. There's basically no lamina. Um, it's basically a cord of Sertoli cells together with um, spermatogonial stem cells. The stem cells are disorganized among the small Sertoli cells. And then an amazing physiological change happens to form the thick lamina and the lumen and set up the a developmental progression. So uh, we did uh, about 10,000 cells um, uh, to look at puberty. Uh, again, this goes from uh, 1, 7, 11, 13, 14, 25. Um, we did the casting, so we know what all of the cells are. I won't go through that again because I went through it previously. Um, we were able to recluster then just the germ cell uh, lineage and, ex and explore that and uh, do the casting to get confidence in the order, and the order was what we had seen before, but there's a bias in terms of where these samples fall in terms of the order, with the young, uh, the, the, the uh, infants and the youth basically having all their spermatogonia here, as I'll show you more in a moment. So um, this, is a this is a depiction of just the spermatogonia and, um, and germline laid out either at, in, in four steps of whether they're undifferentiated, differentiated, spermatogonia, spermatocytes, or spermatids. Uh, this is percentage, okay? Whereas this is total numbers of cells. So it's, this is both germline and, um, and the niche cells, okay? So I'll, 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 I'll toggle back and forth here. Uh, this is a little bit hard to see, so I'll help you. So this is spermatogonia. So for example, only about 3% of the cells um, in uh, total cells in the testis are spermatogonia in a one or a seven-year-old, and 100% of those cells are undifferentiated, okay, by our criteria. And then things change at 11. At 11, you get this huge expansion. About 15% of the cells are, 15 to 20, are spermatogonia. So you have had a spermatogonial expansion. 
And, um, but you don't yet have any sort of mature spermatids coming out at that point, okay? You have differentiated, you have immature spermatids, but you don't make any um, uh, mature sperm yet. And then, uh, uh, then between the 13-year-old sample and the 14-year-old sample, a, a huge change occurs. And the, the four, our 14-year-old looked a lot like our 25-year-old. So I want to say, uh, it's not meant to mean that these samples pin every person of that age, right? This is a one person who happened to be that age. And we would like to have dozens and dozens of samples where we could do testis weight and other types of criteria that uh, endocrinologists use for staging. But that is just not possible, right? It is extremely hard to get these samples. You can do certain validation tests, uh, which we have done as well with a collaborator, but I just want to leave you with that. So you can even see the expansion between the 7 and the 11-year-old of these UTF1 positive um, er, undifferentiated spermatogonia at low levels uh, in the 7-year-old and then lots of them in the 11-year-old. So you can even see this expansion in, in a validation setting. Um, one of the things we were uh, really interested in seeing is so there are myoid cells and Leydig cells are two of the cells of the testis that um, are the sporting niche. Very different cells, but it turns out that they come from a common uh, precursor. So um, the pseudotime uh, told us that actually um, our one and seven year olds, you could see these early cells and that they actually went down two different lineages. So you could see in these early cells actually markers that you would normally only see in later cells. Um, on, on both sides, so they would be both IGF-1 positive and ACTA-2 positive, for example. So these cells would, be, would express at low levels markers normally used to discriminate what the two cell types actually are. So they think that they derive from a common uh, precursor in the, um, in the juvenile, whereas this process would have been defined much earlier in the fetal case in the mouse. You can also see this in a pseudotime format, um, where you can now project the cells. So these are the only the one-year-old cells, only the seven, only the 11. You can sort of see them pro, um, progress in pseudotime down into the two different uh, lineages. We also were able to demonstrate computationally that we think there are two Sertoli states. Uh, that an immature we call one and an immature two that are present um, early in uh, development. Uh, you can see these, especially in these early samples. And then the mature Sertoli seem to be uh, much more homogeneous. We do not know if these are two developmental states. I actually don't think they are. I think they're probably physiological states, but without lineage tracing, there's no way to know for sure. But computationally, they're clearly different. Um, you can sort of see the, the populations converging by pseudotime. Um, they have certain properties, very striking properties, like the percentage of mitochondrial um, RNA uh, expression and ribosomal protein expression is very different between these two populations, and they resolve to a single one as, uh, as they mature. I think I'll just go through these quickly for time. Uh, for example, androgen receptor is one clear example where that develops later. You see many more androgen receptor positive cells. This is a bit bright in here. Um, and the other thing we were able to show is changes as, as Sertoli cells mature um, uh, in transcription factors um, and in signaling pathways like notch pathway, for example. One of the most striking, though, which I had no idea even existed, was this uh, class of defensin peptides and other types of small antimicrobial peptides, uh, a whole suite of them which are highly upregulated in, in Sertoli cells. So it's, you're across the blood-brain barrier. You, don't, you can't get immune cells to help um, protect your seminiferous tubule. So it looks like the strategy is that um, Sertoli cells secrete, uh, once they're mature, uh, the, a whole lots and lots of these small uh, antimicrobial peptides. So it turns out, um, uh, yeah, you can see that we can even stain for some of them. And that'll be important for something I tell you in just a minute. So um, uh, this is kind of a summary for time. I'm not going to go through it. I'll just sort of go through it at the end. But I will tell you that we noticed that the, as the lady cells make testosterone and they start and they split from um, the uh, myoid cells early in this process and start to make testosterone. So they're almost making of testosterone is almost part of the developmental pathway of, of the process. So we wondered whether uh, wh what does testosterone do in the human system to help either establish or maintain testis development? We can't do establishment, but we could do maintenance because there are you can get uh, 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 people who have are on testosterone suppression. Um, so. Uh, Trans females who are undergoing gender confirmation surgery go on long-term testosterone suppression. And we were able to get um, two samples uh, to study and do all this genomics with. 
And the results, I think, are quite interesting. Uh, here uh, is an example of one of them. Uh, so a ton of spermatogonia and almost no spermatocytes and very, very, very few sper spermatids or uh, mature sperm. It's known that this greatly reduces or eliminates uh, sperm production in people uh, over time. Um, I won't go through all the casting, but it was quite clear. Uh, we could show that in one patient, uh, the um, uh, sp early spermatogonia are highly um, upregulated in terms of percentage relative to untreated. Uh, and in some cases, there is actually 100% of the um, germline is actually these undifferentiated spermatogonia. Uh, one of the things we wanted to know is what, are the, what is the state of that spermatogonia? So are they very much like untreated males? Or are these, um, are, are these spermatogonia very, very different now um, than, than the untreated? So we did T-SNE and other types of analysis that basic, and we were able to look at the top 100 genes, basically, let's say of state zero genes or state one genes in the untreated case and say, how much is that like the, um, the, uh, the treated? And the untreated and treated are almost indistinguishable, okay? So they're very much like one another. I think that makes sense because you have undifferentiated type zero and type one spermatogonia as a juvenile or an infant and there's very, very little testosterone. So having no testosterone is actually a normal state before you hit puberty. So the cells simply either stay in or revert to this, that, that, that state before puberty, okay? That wasn't the only thing that reverted. Uh, we could actually see an effect on the Sertoli cells. So this is that the transgender does not look exactly like the 14-year-old or the 25-year-old in terms of where they cells position. It looks regressed. So we tried to figure out what is the difference at the gene level uh, between them. And what we found is, I told you about these defensin peptides here, this whole suite. Basically, they are extremely high. This is a log scale. Extremely high in the um, uh, untreated males, but in the treated males, they are extremely low or undetectable. So we think these are androgen, or testosterone dependent, testosterone driven. Um, uh, innate uh, peptides. And, and I think the obvious possibility is that um, you don't activate them until you're sexually mature uh, because you don't have any risk. You have much less risk of infection before you become sexually active. So um, I think I'll, uh, for time, I just see the time is gone. So there, were, there are other things I don't have time to show today, but I think it's quite interesting that we were able to look at all sorts of signaling pathways between the germline and the niche and uh, ideas about in going forward, what types of things we might look at. The retinoic acid pathway is interesting. Um, what uh, retinoic acid being created and destroyed and where that's occurring. We're very interested in the activin pathway. Uh, we couldn't help but notice that basically the activin receptors are in the spermatogonia that the spermatogonia are making actually inhibitors to the activin path or to the to that pathway, and neighboring cells are making activators of that pathway. And some of those greatly change at particular times, like here, the inhibitor, inhibin A, is actually very high when you're not going through spermatogonial expansion, and then low when you do. So we think we might have some clues about a human or primate-specific or applicable um, ligand systems that we can explore that haven't been explored before in the mouse for these types of issues. So uh, taken together, um, the puberty part of the story, which was published uh, this morning, um, shows uh, three th phases, I think, for the spermatogonia, uh, all undifferentiated, then activated or uh, expanded. You start making spermatogonia, but you don't let them make sperm, and then you progress them to sperm production. We think two Sertoli states can form down to one. We would like to understand what these two states are different, what, how they're really different. We have a progenitor cell that bifurcates into making the lamina and making testosterone, so very, very different cell types. Um, and we've been able to work on uh, testosterone suppression by having these precious samples from trans females and uh, been able to show that those uh, spermatogonia basically look like the undifferentiated state you would see in a juvenile. And we hope next to use this information to help culture spermatogonial stem cells and progress from undifferentiated to differentiated. And uh, we're working on this establishment of state zero in the fetus. Uh, and I'll thank you for your time and uh, I'm happy to take questions. go to mature maturity Sertoli cells or Sertoli cells yeah. I, I guess the thing that I'm wondering about is did you try 
do you think that they could be actually making, they could be progenitors of subtypes of the mature cells and then trying to recluster out those mature cells and then see if they are actually uh, making more specific cell types, I guess is my point. We, we did try to subcluster them and we didn't see anything that would give us confidence in that. I think it's really hard. I mean, I think we have to be careful when you interpret them. Um, uh, without lineage tracing, et cetera, we, we really don't know. But what, what one, uh, we are interested in, in pursuing it. Uh, my, my, my gut tells me that they're probably just different states, and you don't have the same type of cycling uh, that you have in, in, in mature cells. Yeah. State. So I loved your theory about uh, plasticity as yeah. being non-chromatin non-DNA methylation changes. Yeah. So is that mostly signaling of different kinds? It, it would have to be. So thank you for asking. It leaves me a little bit more time to expand on what I mean by that, OK? So I love, as you know, I love chromatin. I love chromatin changes, and I love chromatin modifications, and I think they're all important and interesting. That said, I think we have to know when, um, you know, what is what is cause and what's consequence, et cetera. So I'm not I'm not saying that there are no chromatin modifications that are happening, right? There, we, we've checked. We and others have checked for during gametogenesis, for example, things get acetylated when they get active and K4 and all all that stuff happens. Okay, so chromatin modifications are still I think regulating the um, uh, these pathways. Uh, but I think it I think the the logic is that you're starting off at the beginning. Um, fixing two things. You're fixing DNA methylation. Uh, I don't mean it's, it's, anything's broken. You're establishing a state of DNA methylation and a state of open chromatin. Um, one you want to keep completely unchanged. And that is actually, if you, if you, this is true also if you go through gametogenesis. So if you don't just stop it at the end of spermatogonia, go through gametogenesis, there's no change. We spent a lot of money on the mouse and the human showing there is no change. I wanted there to be a change, okay? So that, that, that I think, is, is a fundamental principle. I think that's something from an epigenetic inheritance standpoint. You want to you lock that down really strongly. Um, it seems that that is also, uh, you are also opening that platform initially for, um, uh, for spermatogonial differentiation. So I think that you're going to have signaling control, that's absolutely right, with, um, with transcription factors, and that interplay will determine which transcription factors are maybe getting uh, translated, are moving into the nucleus, and are then executing those programs. Yep. Uh, were you able to look at chromatin confirmation in the transgendered individuals and compare them to uh, the non-transgendered and, and infant the, the, no, we were not. We did not. Um, we didn't look at a tax seek or a high C or anything like that. Yeah. Brad, it's an, it's an interesting possibility that the chromatin is maintained in an open state, yeah. uh, which would be, um, you know, like uh, embryonic and susceptible to many changes. So I'm curious about whether you've actually looked at testicular cancer to see yeah. whether it actually evokes that kind of. Um, organization, which you do see in a number of other cancers, which reprogram to an embryonic state? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. I'll give a little of nuance to the first question, or first comment. So uh, when, you, when we say embryonic, one of the contrasts I made there was between an ES cell and the spermatogonial stem cell. They are actually incredibly different in what's open. So they, they are, uh, I'd say, very, very different. And um, but. Embryonic form of the, so the, the early spermatogonia. Uh, right. So, the, and those, those two are those the undifferentiated spermatogonia are actually very, very different from the embryonic stem cells. Right. Um, that what we ha we haven't done, and you ask a very good question there, uh, compared it compared either the the open the open chromatin state to tumors, and I I think. Um, if you look at the RNA-seq, though, I mean, it's incredibly different. So w many germ cell tumors um, will have, for example, an activation of the pluripotency network. They'll either be nanog positive or they can be OCK4 positive. Not all of them, but more than you see in, in some other cancer types. And I, what, what's, what the spermatogonia can do, actually in a very quick way, in both um, in, in the mouse system at least, is they convert from these um, germline stem cells to being just like embryonic stem cells, and then they differentiate, right? So I think this is a fundamental principle. If you, if you look at 
what is, on, what is, what is distinctly off in a germline stem cell? It's nanog OC4 and SOX2. I mean, they are, they are completely off. But if you look at the accessory transcription factors that people associate with pluripotency, they're actually on. So I think this is a fundamental part of the strategy of germline stem cells. They uh, ha have to demethylate all the Hox genes, Fox Hox, they demethylate all the transcription factors that are going to drive development and differentiation. Um, they leave the, the pluripotent, everything about the pluripotency network is open and on and basically poised by bivalent chromatin. So it's all just like an ES cell, but you hollow out the middle. You DNA methylate OCT4 nanog SOX2 so that you can't enter into the implementation of development. That, I think, is a fundamental principle, okay? And what goes wrong in cancer is you don't do that. You don't keep that system completely off. And that's why, the, so the germ cell tumors can all be of three, all three germ layers, okay? So they have tremendous <laughs> developmental potential. And if you look on the female side, you have teratomas. And those have ears and teeth and hair, right? They have unlimited developmental potential. That actually was one of the things that drove me into working on this issue, is the cancer biology. I mean, it's amazing. You've got a stem cell that can become anything, anything, right? Before fertilization, right? It's on one side or the other, right? So it has the potential, but holds it in check. So I think that's a, that's a key concept. Hi, Brad. Hi. Uh, um, I was just curious about the defensins and the peptides yeah. that you, so do you have any insight into how the how testosterone is regulating those genes? Do you find sort of regulatory elements that are associated with those genes? Or? So uh, yes, as we have dug into this, it turns out that one of these classes, it's in the literature already, has an androgen receptor binding site. And um, they have already done experiments in, in vivo, um, uh, in culture systems, to, to show that they are androgen dependent to turn them on. So I think that may extend then to this whole um, suite that we're seeing. For, do you do you sense that the trans female will be a good opportunity to help you with the culture system? Like it seems like they, they are much more homogeneous potentially in terms of the undifferentiated state or I, I don't know, I'm just guessing. I think we're, I think we're gonna use information everywhere we can get it. Um, we have, we've made progress with it, um, but I think, I think there is an, I think it's much more complicated in the, in the human system uh, I think there are ligands and attachment needs um, that aren't being satisfied in either a uh, uh, cell culture or organoid system. So we're, we're making the most progress right now in uh, keeping the tubule going uh, in the dish. So, yeah. All right, well, with that, uh, Brad, thanks very okay, much. Okay, thank you. Thank you.